friends, welcome to Unwarranted Music Opinions. I'm Jim Lindberg here with Brian Courtney. Hello. Chaz Jenkins. Hello. And according to my No Borders Here vinyl, Canada's most critically acclaimed new artist, Jane Cyberry. Seaberry. Seaberry. We've been calling you Cyberry for months. It doesn't really matter, you know, but it's Seaberry. Gosh, I'm a real fake fan, aren't I? And, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, you can be a fake fan. <laughs> let's, start off, let's start off really fake. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing I'm just going to ask, how are you holding up through all of the world's tumult right now? I'm doing fine. I am feel really engaged with the whole stream of change and the people who are hoping for it. I never thought we would get to this point. So I'm super, super hopeful about this being um, not just a little change, but like a tipping point mm -hmm. towards um, not being another Atlantis that blew it. So I've always felt sort of hopeless. So I think that maybe changes in the air for people just saying, I can't believe I put up with this all my life. And the pandemic has stopped the world and, and reminded us of lots of really good things. So I'm doing... Great. And because my job is a musician and, you know, touring, I'm still writing lots and things that are even closer to my heart than before. And I'm more connected with people in a way just because of all the Zoom things going on. And I love that. I love being engaged more with the world. Um, how about you guys? We're holding up. We're holding up. Yeah. We're pretty bored here. At least I am. I've been just listening to as much music as possible, a lot of it yours. As you said, I've been appreciating the tipping point for change that you mentioned. It needs a um, momentum from more bodies. So if you're bored, come to my Sunday night meditations where we're learning to hold peace and interact with people and hold peace instead of being defensive, like tools for every day. And Tuesday night solidarity Tuesdays. So we have speakers from all over, and we're actually speaking to a place in East St. Louis. I don't know. There's just so much to do, and a lot of it's just um, showing up with our own energy. So it'd be great if you could come and add to it, all of you. So don't be bored. <laughs> we've talked about two of your albums here on the show. First, we talked about The Walking, and then we talked about No Borders Here. And we all were pretty huge fans of them. Myself... Included, I I, uh, I brought those albums to the show because I felt that more people needed to hear them. I was amazed that not as many people had heard them, at least from my generation, that the whole music nerd, music fan community, I was like, people would love this. They just need to hear it. Thank you for and, that. Yeah. And, and something that struck me about both of those albums are the themes and the messages that for me personally, I get from them themes of self-understanding and growth. What would you say were the themes and messages that you wanted to yeah. put in music? I didn't want to do anything, as you can guess, but um, the things that draw me to write about are things I'm always thinking about, which is understanding how things fit together and um, growth, which I think we're all here to do. And too many people are bored, including myself often. And that's, um, we're not connected and we will stay at a middle vibration in that vibration. But the world, we're designed to be happier and have more energy and be connected and to take care of our brothers and sisters, so to speak. I think um, a lot of people any age have to say, how come life isn't what I thought it was going to be? And deal with the disappointment and then observe everything and then come up with a way to walk the planet closer to our largest self. My songs are more about that. Like, how do we get to the largest self that we feel every now and then? You know, when you're at your brightest and where people actually smile at you and you're not doing anything. You know, that people just recognize that charge of energy, which everyone has. And be efficient about removing things that don't make us that way. So... That's always been of interest to me, probably from the records you were listening to, that was more inside, 
Now it's more, I don't feel so comfortable talking about myself. It's more universal, which may be uh, appealing less to people, but it seems right. I remember after 9-11, I played New York a week later. They still wanted me to play. And I had to stop about four songs that I was playing because we were all in a different state of shock and grief. And my personal songs felt really out of order. And I said, I hope I never forget this sensing, if it's the right thing for me to never forget it. And uh, I think I have remembered it on some level. So I wanted to ask, this is kind of a simple question, but you've been making music for quite a long time. What started that? What was the spark that got you into making music and go on to create all of these different projects? I didn't really expect to like or get my music when I started. I just was in my bedroom trying to start things out and I uh, hear in music, so I started to write. And then uh, people started, you know, showing me that they found value in it. And so I just kept going. I made independent music. I heard a lot of things in my head that I hadn't heard elsewhere, so I wanted to hear it. So I wrote music that I would like to hear. I went through that whole schoolroom of, you know, being on a record label, being asked to do things that didn't seem right, deciding inside myself what I could accept or not accept, making mistakes and owning my values. I've always uh, made music since I could climb up on the piano bench, just sort of improvise. But then doing it in public, I started to write songs when I was 16, anchor some of the music into song form, and then sort of got drawn out because people seemed to find value in it. Watching interviews and watching your uh, your most recent post to uh, one of these meditations was on your YouTube channel where you spoke to uh, specifically Miss Gupta. Oh, yeah in there and in this interview so far, you mentioned vibrations and kind of, so I definitely, and I don't mean to uh, pit you into a corner when I say this or anything like that. It's just something I'm unfamiliar with and I'm curious about, but uh, it comes like very spiritual to me when you talk about like vibrations and like seeing things in nature and stuff like that. It, how does your spirituality kind of inform you in music and just in general? How has that spirituality changed or come about throughout your life? Well, let's remove the word spirituality. Mm -hmm. My desire to understand how ener everything's energy, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ultimately, you are a ball of energy beyond your cells and everything. It's the core of who you are is energy. The table is energy. Everything can be reduced. So I really didn't like it when I was at the tail end of the New Age time and people were sort of talking through their, their hats and everything seemed too poetic and hippie-ish. And it actually was... Um, me wanting to know scientifically what energy was made me switch from music into a science degree to learn from the bottom up. So that's when I agreed within myself that energy was can be described as a, a frequency, and every person's a multitude of frequency, which gives you a sort of sound, like it would if you hit certain notes on a piano. To me, that's really um, scientific and physics based, and. Um, that's all I believe. I sort of built it from the bottom up like a lot of people because um, people are saying things without having a foundation. So there's so many slips in their logic. It really bugged me. So, yeah, so I've stuck to that. And now I, I made a decision to speak the way I think, knowing that there'd be reactions like yours, that it, you think maybe it's actually coming from a non-scientific world. But I've done a lot of learning on in terms of energy. When I, you know, use my hands for therapeutic touch or whatever you call it, I understand these are positive, negative, positive, negative poles, electromagnetic poles, which of course creates a magnetic pull. So you can actually pull disturbances out of someone's energy field. That's the way I want to understand it. Not just that you can touch people and heal them. Spiritual to me means like believing there's something greater than what we see with our eyes. I would assume everyone's spiritual in a way because we believe that there are feelings, and you can't see feelings. We believe that they exist. I have a question more specifically about the music you made, not just on the two albums, but just, well, kind of like across the discography kind of thing. Would I be correct to say that you took on a lot of the production and mixing responsibilities for your first couple of records? Yes. And then later on, and I just read this, so I don't know if it's true, you were more comfortable letting other people in on the production and the mixing of the record 
I remember you worked with uh, one gentleman who whose name I can't recall off the top of my head, but he had done work for several film scores over his career. And then uh, the other name was Brian Eno that you had kind of let them help you with the production, basically. What was the change that made you more comfortable letting people in on the records you were making? Actually, it's the opposite. Mm. I started with people because I didn't really know what I was doing and friends helped. And then I worked for No Borders here and I was working with two producers, John Switzer. And then mm. by the fourth record, I didn't want to work with the producer because I knew that I knew what I wanted and people started getting in my way. I mean, there's no point to doing music unless you're trying to realize the full scope of what you see. And that's that's how I work with other people, too. It's like, say if someone came to me on my record label and they'd say, would you put my record on your label? And I'd say, not until you bring me something that sounds more like you. And it's always the opposite. You should exaggerate your essence. That's the most wonderful thing you can offer. I knew that about myself, so. Brian Eno was... Um, sort of a superficial thing in that he wrote a letter to Warner Brothers and said, why have you not done more with this artist? So they sort of kept that in mind and asked him to produce my next record. He did. I w went to England to work with him and we worked on three songs, but he's not big on vocals, doing vocals or producing vocals. And we worked on some arrangements. He came up with a beautiful sound at the beginning of Sail Across the Water on When I Was a Boy and worked on Temple. That wasn't what he really wanted to do. He just wanted to, I like this and you should do more. I brought it back to Canada and replaced some things. And <laughs> um, it wasn't what you think it was. Mm. Everyone always does the knee jerk thing where you say they did all the work, but no, I think you hear how I would, and I'm not talking from my ego. I'm just talking precision. So when we reviewed No Borders Here and The Walking, I personally, Really enjoyed the walking, but No Borders Here hit a lot closer to home for me. I thought the melodies, the music was just fantastic. Love Extra Executives, love Symmetry. All those songs are so catchy and fun. The one song, though, that I, I know we're being a bit vague with some of our questions. There's one song that I really wanted to ask you personally about. Because in the documentary, I Muse Aloud, you mentioned that a lot of your music is personal. Dancing Class. Could you please elaborate on what led you to write a song like that? What is some of the themes or messages about that particular song that you were trying to convey? Because I feel like that song in particular is very beautiful and very tragic, at least in my eyes, the way I interpret it. But I wanted to hear from you personally what about that song, what that song means to you. As we speak, I'm going to get the lyrics up too. So. I remember taking a workout class and um, a year later and I'm not a big workout freak or have been different periods in my life, but I noticed that person year after year when I go check in on myself just through taking a dancing class, it doesn't really matter what you do, but that seemed a beautiful thing that you look at the same thing and you become aware of the different angles of the panes of glass, the facets of your being. And then it became a holder to capture other things that went into it. I don't know why, um, why it turned tragic or that went into it, but I think a lot of my songs have a balance that way or imbalance, however you see it. And I had a friend in Germany, Christiana, who I loved the sound of her voice and her accent, so I really wanted to, that's sort of my inner sense is that you grow or you die. You can see too many people who are living dead, walking dead, so to speak. They're mm -hmm. shut down or couples that are shut down because they don't, They've deadened each other, so they really should split up. I grew up in the suburbs. Someone tried to make me ashamed of that when I was starting out music. They said, you should say you're from Harlem or something like that. It's like, I didn't know better. I thought, I don't know, is this what you're supposed to do? But instead, I, at a much later date, I became really glad that I grew up in the suburbs, a middle-class family, because um, I'm really important that that's where I came from, because I, I was living inside the predominant culture, which is white and titled, not what I thought of it then, of um, low-grade depression and unhappiness and really unnourishing culture. If you've been to Europe or anywhere like that where people have special use of words to reset, acting with each other, like I always say good morning on the street. Don't walk by and just say nothing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 
you're engaged. Our culture is very cold and not really trained in manners. That's been a very big source of information to me, I think, in my songs. I really want people to have happier lives than that. The record Teenager, which was a collection of songs that you had written long, you know, the first, they were the first songs you had written in the little spoken word kind of bit, you know, talking about what the album is. This question may not work too well, but what kind of made it the right time? I know you had just finished recording the, uh, the live record and had some studio time left over and um, you were able to record these songs. Do you remember what made you feel like it was the right time to release these songs? Definitely know when it's the wrong time. That's how I know when a song's finished, my gut. So I use my gut a lot and it just seemed, okay, maybe you want a different kind of answer. Live and then sort of like a sorbet, so to speak, to clear the palate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You just have a sense of timing. We all do. And I'm big on um, listening to it. There is a certain point where like I'm making decisions and I'll have to go through the timer and say, I think that's right thing to do but my heart won't let me like maybe it's even breaking up with someone or whatever one day i realized it didn't matter what i decided my heart was always winning in my experience so i think the heart and the gut are like connection to our um by yourself knows better what's right for us in this lifetime so big on really listening to the intuition the gut feeling i have a question about your records musically because when i I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of 80s new wave and all that stuff and i've noticed when listening to your albums especially my two favorites new words here in the walking that there are a lot of ambitious ideas thrown in there that you might not hear in a lot of other music for example the the bit about the grouper fish on extra executives or how some of the songs on the walking take these winding paths to get where they end up being like the more ambient forest sound on the bird and the gravel these stories sometimes very surreal like lena is a white table with just the surreal imagery what inspired you to take this relatively ambitious approach to making very unique and creative music like that just what I heard and saw and I just the drive to get as close to what I could as close as possible if you get it if you like those songs that must mean it's an aesthetic that's natural enough for you so why would you not do that can you imagine if you're writing I think maybe you do what would stop you from doing it what would make you some songs take 20 minutes some songs take two minutes I really wasn't too aware of how others would see them and I remember, I just knew they felt right, core of the song outward. I remember going to Warner Brothers with my demo. They really wanted me to leave off the vigil. To me, that was like the heart of the record. So I thought, they don't get that that's the heart of the record, in a way. They're like completely different pages. And they wanted to ask me if I would up working with a producer and take less advance. I was fine with the less advance. I don't really want people losing money on me doesn't feel good. Not the producer, because I understood they didn't really get it. I wanted to ask kind of a two-part question. When you started writing music, you know, during the 80s, what were some artists that inspired you? And I understand that you're still writing music now. Are there new artists that you've been listening to that inspire some of the music you make? No, but I'm waiting. Loved so many kinds of music. I was being inspired. Oh, I don't want this to sound like an ego thing. No, no, but... I don't want it to be narcissistic, that I only want to hear people like me. Maybe that's sort of what we're all doing. Inspiration would be like musical inspiration, like Miles Davis and people I trust. Mm -hmm. So new people today, I'm sure I have and little pieces here and there. It's classical things, but I can't tell you who. But I really like to be spoken to. Uh, Someone say the things I don't understand and want to hear, but doesn't seem to be a place where people are writing from that I've heard anyway. Talking about influences, I remember you, um, it's an old interview in the I Muse Aloud documentary too, which I managed to get in. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember you mentioned, mo- you know, you had influences outside of music like Monty Python. And I don't remember what specifically you referenced, 
but it was something about his surrealism maybe or something about his uh i don't want to say absurdity necessarily even though what he does is kind of i i like money i love his movies but um you know he, what he does is sort of absurd too but i think it's you know while it is funny it's also more than funny to me in a way and that was the most striking part of the interview to me was you know talking about monty python as a inspiration for the kind of things you were doing at least at the time yeah at the time um, I, th- I think i was trying to stretch the way that we think of inspirations a bit it's mm-hmm. not like a i tried to copy them but the humor some of it was like that perfect irony that i think human humor can be sacred at a certain level same as music right humor opens you someone who's inspiring when they speak it open opens you and that's always a good thing and not many comedians like that but the right kind i tend to get sort of unstoppable um, anger when i hear bad comedians because it's almost like it asks for me in a way because it's makes it hard to go to comedy clubs sometimes if it's mean or but then you go somewhere where they make you laugh and it's greater understanding about things it sort of puts things in perspective in a way that you know <laughs> makes you laugh at yourself and so their humor sometimes has that, although I've seen them in the wrong mood and really not make them at all. But some yeah. of their humor is... <laughs> yeah, um, I've definitely ironic. caught, you know, yeah. caught like maybe a wrong... Maybe the first joke you've heard from them isn't the best representation of them or they might have, you know... Talking about comedians specifically, I've definitely gotten that kind of vibe. Do you uh, like any of the Edgar Wright movies? Any of the stuff that's like um, Hot Fuzz, Shaun of the Dead, stuff like that? I feel like his sense of humor is in that Monty Python spirit like them yeah 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 they're just they're movies that are that understand their movies so you're not you know the comedy is in how they're shot and stuff like that so i think they're a lot of fun for that they're not just writing funny jokes and then making a movie around they kind of that's kind of off topic but yeah they're those are really good movies i don't know i'm just gonna get the edgar wright recommendation in there <laughs> i want to <laughs> just gonna write that down that's great thanks for telling me about that i'll check it out go right so you've mentioned and i've Reference it a few times that you're still writing music and you've had plenty of time. We've all had plenty of time to do more artistic endeavors. I know, you know, speaking from experience, my girlfriend has gotten a lot more into painting and she's been getting really good at it and she's had a lot of time to get really good at it. What? Oh, cool. So I know your last album was released in 2016. Are you planning to release any more music anytime soon, especially with how much you've been culminating because of the pandemic? Those were studio records, and then I went on tour for seven months all over the world doing, like, mostly houses, which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And then I um, I wrote a lot on tour. Like, every night on tour is, like, a super creative night, rewriting the show every night. I have new songs from that, and then I did a live record from a, one of the shows. I really like to do produced music, mm-hmm. writing and uh, learning logic better than I have, so I'm a bit more able to write what I hear in my head without working with an engineer because I always get stuck and then I forget what I was doing. I'm getting better at that. So I have some new songs I've sort of produced and I've released one of them. Someone else produced it, Venus, as a single. So I'm going to start releasing song a day, song at a time, at least one. In a way, it's sort of better because you honor the song, like you sort of present and say, and this is about it and... Let's listen to it, and I'll sit here on Facebook Live and listen with you, and we'll mm-hmm. honor it. Because often things get pushed into a record, and then all these M's get sort of, they lose their sharp edges. In a way, I sort of like that, and I have a lot of ideas, and I have a song that's really important to me about, now it's called, We're So Sick, mm-hmm. We're So Corrupt. We don't even know it. You know, We lie half the time without knowing it. Everything we see around us is a manifestation of our own sickness. So don't point fingers. Just let's all work on ourselves. Boils up to the surface. And that will show up in uh, wanting to say, as we raise our vibration, like when a woman gets pregnant, her vibration goes up because she's creating life and, and there's really something energetic that has to happen to create life. You naturally edit out your desire for smoking and drinking gets edited out because it doesn't fit at that higher vibration. Mm-hmm. And when you get depressed and your vibration's lower, you sabotage yourself even more. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As we raise our vibration, which I think is what's happening 
the planet in a mass way, maybe hit a tipping point where we're say, uh uh-uh, uh, we're not going to accept that anymore. Or, uh uh-uh, uh, you can't drive around with your muffler scaring people. That's so hard on the nervous system, and it's not fair to people who were in wars. To that point where we feel the support of others around us, that will create a new government. I think Trump is a manifestation of how sick we are. It's not pointing the finger at him, but he's doing his job for the universe, bringing all this shit to the surface. And now we see how much bigotry there is, right? Yes. I mean, it was always there. He gave them a platform. Yeah, and it was hidden with Obama. You could believe good things, but it wasn't the truth of it. And uh, now we have to really deal with it. And so um, I'm so glad and hopeful, and that's what the song is about. But it's sort of like, not just like a downer, but it's like a, a tracking. And then every time we say this, later in the song, I have that part, and then I have the alternative words. Like it's things that I need to hear. Here's an example, not from that song, but I'm poor. I'm, I can't get anything I like opposite is like the higher vibrating thing is i don't have a budget right now feel it in your body the difference i don't have a budget right now things that really concern me that i'm creating a tracking piece for myself really about atlantis and about sparta where do you get the discipline from what does it look like lincoln his integrity that he beat the slaves but he would not anything illegal Mm -hmm. it wouldn't help slaves get up to canada Mm -hmm that kind of integrity I think we're all like learning about it that's the big song in my mind and it's sort of growing musically I'll put it out like one that might even be one section at a time well thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us yeah. thanks for asking me and I, I wish you guys all the best I wasn't expecting yeah. sending some emails out but we really appreciate you fitting us into your schedule and it was a pleasure yeah. talking to you Thank you for your yeah. time. Thank you for your activism and speaking out. I really appreciate it. How do I appreciate it? Talking, well, even if it didn't go for these nerds. <laughs> nerds are us. Yes. That's right. Absolutely. All right. You take care, guys. Bye, Jane. Take care. Take care.